Growing up on Nantucket Island, where the air tastes of salt and beach plum, Magdalena migrated to the quiet corner of Connecticut, enveloping herself in a haven of yellow birch and hemlock trees. She received her BFA from the Lyme Academy College of Fine Art in Old Lyme, Connecticut, and studied at the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C. Recently awarded residencies include the Hale Residency on, Nan on Nantucket and the Zartan AIR in Lisbon, Portugal, along with receiving the Wardlaw Grant from the Lyme Academy and the Wood Raff Living Trust Fellowship. She has participated in numerous regional exhibitions. Please welcome Magdalena. All right, hello everyone. My name is Magdalena Pulaski and I am a painter and printmaker. I'd like to start off by thanking the faculty at UConn, in particular my committee, Laurie Sloan, Catherine Myers, and Allison Paul, for always encouraging me to do better and being sound supports when I needed it the most. I also want to thank my cohort who has become more of a family to me over the past three years. I would never have had such an amazing experience here without you all. So I wanted to begin my presentation by introducing my maternal history and talking a little bit about the influence it plays on my identity. Much of my understanding of this history is simply by it being passed down orally. My grandmother, or Babcha Stanisława, grew up in a small village near Krakow, Poland during World War II to a Jewish family. Krakow was occupied by the Nazis and therefore one of the few cities not bombed. Her father was the tailor in the village, raising seven children, my babcha being the youngest. Due to the impact of the war and aftermath of years under the oppressive communist regime, much of that identity is lost and had to be changed to survive. My mother grew up in Warsaw, her father dying in a free car crash where a pole ran straight through his head when she was little. Raising two children on her own, my babcha handmade all my mother's clothes, carefully stitching and puckering dress sleeves. This is a prayer card that was passed down from my grandmother to my mother and then to me. Pictured on the card is a guardian angel watching over children. Painted in pastel hues and fitting into my palm, I've tenderly cared for it since being in my possession. I love every fold and crease on this card, paper thin and worn from years of being passed through nervous and trusting hands. I keep this card in my wallet for protection and good luck. It ignites memories of the icon paintings that hung in my grandmother's small apartment and stained glass churches. I've not only been inspired to translate these colors into my work, but also incorporate the memories it evokes, the protection it offers, and my deep appreciation of it as a visceral object. Being the daughter of immigrant parents with broken English as a child, I was absolutely mortified. I remember sitting in a, in a restaurant, beat red, begging my parents to chiho, move to Angel school, to please speak English. Many people assumed my parents were uneducated, ate pierogies and kielbasa, and only here for a green card. Immigrating to Detroit, Michigan in the late 1980s with $200 in their pockets, my mother would often complain of their adverse first impression of the United States, littered with McDonald chains and bleak highways. Polish is my first language and I still stumble upon words occasionally when I speak, thinking of a better way to say things in Polish and vice versa. Perhaps this is what drew me to painting so much, painting things that can't be perfectly articulated in words, things that are felt. As an only child, I would provide my own company and spend hours and hours creating my own worlds and stories. I would watch and rewatch The Wizard of Oz dreaming about Dorothy's magic ruby red slippers. These were not just sparkly red sequins and charming bows, they held power. A month after my 20th birthday, my mom passed away abruptly. The identity I pushed away when I was younger crumbled down like a ramshackle foundation of a house. This loss spurred me into revisiting all the parts in my memory bank I had left to try and compose a narrative of my history. I diligently and painstakingly fished for pieces of memories once tossed back carelessly to re rebuild the foundation of home. During my undergrad, a, fr a friend left a bag full of vintage paper dolls in my studio. I carefully laid out each doll in costume, many having handwritten signatures on the back. The tactile sensation instantly reminded me of the prayer card and stacks of old photos. I reveled in each corner and fold. I began cutting and creating my own hand-painted cutouts and composing narratives. 
The more I played and juxtaposed pieces, the more relationships materialized. I yearned to make my cutouts move, and during my second year, I took an animation class that taught me to put the pieces into motion. Taking the premise of a trek of a young girl, the stop on anim motion animation allowed for awkward, discombobulated actions that suggest the gawky and self-conscious journey of prepubescence. Influenced by my own loss, the girl is prompted on a voyage through the five stages of grief. During the final stage of acceptance, the pierced rabbit blooms into a flower, inspired by the Polish boat cutouts called Wyczynianki. I was scrolling through images online, as I often do in the morning, when I stumbled upon Rosa Loy's paintings. I was immediately drawn to every aspect of them. The narratives felt familiar without giving too much away. The bright colors were seducing and reminded me of the illustrated fairy tale picture books and paper dolls I had collected. Loy is admittedly very influenced by the seasons, particularly the transitions in colors, which are reflected in her paintings. The longer I lingered on Loy's paintings, the more something else began to emerge. Something more sinister was hiding in the washy brushwork and pink-cheeked women. Loy's paintings are not attempts at resolving the problem. Instead, they just show the problem, allowing the viewer to make their own decisions to solve it. At the Lyme Academy, I learned how to make a tempera for the first time. I was instantly in love, not only with the creamy lusciousness of the paint, and the gem-like colors of the pigments, but also with the process of actually making the paint. Labor intensive, the paint only stays fresh for a day or two until the rancid smell of spoiled eggs fills your studio. Allowing for the tiniest brush, I'm able to create strands of hair and embroidery threads, providing a meditative and therapeutic process, a balm for anxious thoughts. Seeing that it was one of my most prized possessions, I decided to revisit the box of family photos my first year in grad school. I gingerly pulled out images to paint from. Shaping three inch panels that fit into my palm, I sanded gesso layers to create silky smooth ground like a precious marble. The sizes once again resembled the prayer cards tucked safely into my wallet. Pulling out my tiniest brush, only a few hairs wide, I carefully placed color down. A drop of pink for a snarled lip and a blue under a tired eye. The faces, almost comical yet vulnerable, stared back at the viewer, the figures attempting to pose for the camera. The closer and longer I looked, the more I began composing narratives with the figures in the background. Mysteries began to materialize, cropping became a device to create more complexity, and the miniature scale commanded a closer view. On the contrary with etching, there is a resistance, scratching into a copper plate and taking out frustration. There's an alchemy that occurs in the process of preparing a plate to print. Etching on the backs of used plates filled with scratches from being dropped, like wounds from falling in a bush of thorns, allows for an interruption in the process and image. Inspired by a memory my mother had as a child on a late evening walk through the forest, an owl swarms a little girl as if to warn her of impending danger. The wings surround her as if perhaps she would be snatched up and flown away. Each checker on the dress informs curves and creases. Bats stare down the viewers, slowly exposing their hairy bellies and legs. The scratches on the plate could be caused by their claws attempting to be free from the enclosure. I saw Veja Selman's expansive retrospective to fix the image and memory in person at the Met right before lockdown began. It was the last major exhibition I saw in person for that entire year, and it vehemently stuck with me. Amongst her famous photorealistic paintings of natural environments and phenomena such as the ocean, spider webs, star fields, and rocks, sat this almost dollhouse sized sculpture, House Two, influenced by her childhood in Latvia. The shape of the houses speak of domesticity and comfort, while the paint illustrates trauma and disfiguration. I return again and again to Kiki Smith's work whenever I need a reminder of what art can do. Lauren Moya Ford writes, Smith's body-sized hand-painted Pool of Tears 2 is inspired by Carol's drawings from Alice's Adventures Under. Like many of Smith's work, the image, the message is as magical as it is menacing. Although the prince creatures pursue Alice with their scratchy claws and pointy beaks, 
Their glowing eyes stare only at the viewer, as if we too are part of the chase. When lockdown began, I was stuck at home, away from my studio, printmaking materials, and animation lab. I had experimented with everything from cardboard constructions to making molds of fingers. And honestly, I felt lost. But now with limited space and resources, I decided it was a good time to return to painting. Night Moth was painted in March when I would stare out my bedroom window at dusk, imagining a dancing figure under a street light on a deserted road. Much bigger than a real moth, one could wrap its wings around one's face, not offering not only protection, but also a comforting friend. Elaborately painted wings calmed my mind during hours and hours of free time. Stories crept back slowly into my life. Right before the school shut down and everything went virtual, I had left with a stack of books on European fairy tales. Now I was able to read each page slowly, savoring each story. I began to see metaphors, morals, and similarities in the stories reflected in my personal life. Hybrids of daily life, memories, and fantasies began to surface. Much like Night Moth, the gloves offered a similar feeling of protection, but also magic. During a time where I was afraid to touch a railing or push the cart at a grocery store, I imagined I could slip these enchanted gloves. The egg tempera provided lines thin enough to replicate embroidery threads as I sewed together delicate patterns resembling the moth wings. Two frogs waited patiently in a murky swamp, their eyes glazed over by moonlight as if in a trance. Duplication allows one to observe more carefully, comparing one to the other and finding the small differences, such as an extra bump or violet bruise. During the summer, I picked up a book at the library on Polish peasant art from the 1800s. There were beautiful black and white photograph spreads of cataloged objects, each carefully labeled and described. I was drawn particularly to these elaborate Polish bridal crowns and decided to reinterpret them using my own patterns and colors. Painting them the scale of a real headpiece, they were celebratory and joyous, but also playful like pawns on a game board. The horizon line shifted the scale, transforming them into almost castle-like structures. I began to investigate pattern more and more. On the left, a mother figure cuts a young girl's hair. It is uncertain whether it is done forcefully or willingly as a rite of passage. The pattern sprawls from the larger to the smaller, smaller foreshadowing what one will become. On the right, a blanket or curtain either tucks the figure in safely or smothers. The familiarity of what is represented allows entrance while the actions provide mystery. A young woman peers into the distance. The sharp bows, points of her bow hint at something menacing as the jagged pattern on her sweater leads the eye to the tautly braided hair. In the background, a pattern of candlesticks and hearts inspired by folk cutouts transpose briefly into a pair of shears. I began writing more and more in my diary. Moments of loneliness, but also discovery. Childhood fascinations tinged with dread. A freshly caught glistening severed fish so fresh the blood hasn't drained yet from the intestinal tract, revealing gems in place of fish eggs buried deep in the fleshy pink abdomen. The glistening hands firmly hold a sleek knife in a first person perspective, as if the viewer's hands become the hands gutting the fish. It carries good luck and fortune if one is lucky enough to catch it. Pulling from my writing, I want my paintings to mimic this hybrid where parts are painted more realistically than shifting into something more surreal, much like the trajectory of a fairy tale. Stuck at home with a fever, more antidotes began to appear from observing objects around me. From my junk drawer, I pulled a marble, a match, a seashell, red ribbon, dominoes, and an old brooch, placing them meticulously as if pieces on a chessboard. This winter, we had a tiny mouse rummaging through our cabinets seeking shelter. I often think of the nights I would walk home through my neighborhood. The midnight blue would wrap around me as I peered through a brightly lit window. Inside, a figure transforms into a cloth hung against a wooden chair as a swarm of moths, insects, and birds dance frivolously, providing companionship after nightfall. Thank you for listening, and I welcome any questions. Um, question 
Q&A time. We don't have any at this moment. Actually, I don't think I can type a question in as a panelist, but I have one. May I ask All right. it? <laughs> of course. So, so I've seen this presentation a few times before, and something caught my attention this time. When you were talking about the fish picture with the jewels spilling out, you said something about um, uh, wanting to mix up the real with um, the surreal. It's shifting into something more surreal was your phrase. And I wondered for the first time why you use the word surreal rather than abstract, because that seems also to be a word that might describe, for example, the hands in that picture, right? They become less about verisimilitude and more about abstraction. Could you talk about that, please? That's actually a really good question, and I'm not sure if I've ever really thought about using the word surreal versus abstract. Um, I, I suppose surreal in the, in the sense that uh, gems normally wouldn't be coming out of a fish, um, but abstract, I, I definitely am interested in abstracting things as well, so perhaps that's um, a better use of, of words. Well, I, I think actually what we, we then are talking about are two different components of that picture, right? The, 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 the non-real, the fictional, the metaphoric of the, the gems, right, versus the abstraction of the painterly qualities of the hands. Both of those are, are important. That's interesting. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Magdalena, I'm wondering about the influence, perhaps, of magic realism, the South American in particular, and how much you've looked at that or read that, especially Marquesa. Yes, I actually, um, I have been reading those books, and I, I have been, I've, I've very much enjoyed reading them. Um, and I love those transitions that, ha that occur, um, where something feels very real, and then it goes into something more surreal. So yes, I, I do really love those books. Yep. Have you read Isabel Allende? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Luke, Luke Seward wrote, do you see your studio practice revisiting animation? Oh, um, hi, Luke. Uh, thanks for the great question. I think maybe in the future, yes. I, I just wanted to take a break and focus more on painting, but um, I'm always really interested in, in moving things around and having them move and creating environments that way. So yes, definitely. Definitely in the future. Um, thank you. Catherine Myers writes that, uh, can you describe the sense of implicit danger in your work? Hi, Catherine. Um, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm really interested in moments where um, one is not certain exactly what is about to happen. So for example, in the ritual where the girl is, her hair is being cut, um, there's that feeling of possibly having it be a, a moment where um, this girl is maybe in danger through the through the scissors being too long. These little hints in, in the in the painting, um, but not um, so much in your face that you right away think, oh, this is about that. Um, so I, I like that mystery and going back and forth. Um, Laurie Sloan writes that. Um, she has questions, but she's saving them for the orals. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Kelsey Miller writes, can you talk more about the precision achieved with your painting alongside the chance that it is iner inherent to the process of etching, especially when using the backs of plates? Oh, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I personally, I don't know how to answer this. I, I suppose I, I personally am just so drawn to doing very intricate work. Um, I help find that it helps with my anxiety as well. And um, with etching, there's that resistance really scratching deep into a plate. Um, and with that tempera, you're laying down line, but it's still such a thin line that I can just go for hours kind of doing a similar motion. Um, not sure if that answers the question. Um, we have time for one more question and it's from Jean Sarabolo. Is there any role of chance in your creation of an image? Yes, 100%. I think that's, I, I never have a pre-planned, a very pre-planned plan um, before I start a, an image. I, I love to construct it very intuitively and I find the mo most of my joy comes from that. So absolutely. 
All right. Um, Allison Paul has just submitted one, and that will be our last one, and we'll move on. Uh, Allison writes, you've talked about the game board as a way of describing some of your paintings. Do you see fairy tales as having parallels to board games? a sort of choose your own adventure. Do you hope for that in your character's lives? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, I love that, actually. I haven't, I didn't think of it that way, but I, I love that parallel. Um, and who knows, maybe I'll make a game board next. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. We'll Thank you, everyone.